This is BBC World News. I'm Matthew Emerly Waller. On today's Global, the US House of Representatives makes another attempt to confirm its speaker. A third day, a seventh vote. It is still an uphill struggle for the Republican Kevin McCarthy, who's been blocked by right-wingers in his own party. President Putin orders a ceasefire in Ukraine to mark the Orthodox Christmas, but Kyiv rejects it as hypocritical. Also on today's programme, President Biden outlines a new route for legal entry to the US for thousands of undocumented migrants from Cuba, Haiti and Nicaragua. New revelations from Prince Harry's upcoming book. He says his brother William physically attacked him. We hear from the first journalist who read the entire memoir ahead of its official release. It goes to some very, very personal places and spaces. It's really very naked, maybe psychologically naked. And Pope Benedict is buried in the crypt under St Peter's Basilica at the end of a funeral ceremony attended by tens of thousands at the Vatican. Hello and welcome to BBC News. The deadlock at the heart of the US government is continuing for a third day as the House of Representatives tries to elect a speaker. A seventh vote is taking place on the candidate Kevin McCarthy, who seems to have lost again after failing to convince the Republican right-wingers to back him. It is the first time a speaker hasn't been confirmed in the first round of voting for 100 years, and the deadlock leaves the chamber without sworn-in members and unable to pass legislation. Well, let me take you live to the floor of the House, and you can see that uh, process Jeff is Harris. still continuing Not there uh, ahead of the vote itself, but already it is looking like uh, Kevin Not McCarthy has lost this seventh round. Jeff. Absolutely extraordinary scenes we've yes. seen in the past uh, two or three days. Right. So let's get more on this with Correct. Joshua Hudder, senior fellow at Georgetown University's Government Affairs Institute there in Washington. Thank you so much for being with us. I was talking an hour or so ago to a Republican strategist. She described the situation back on Monday as a, a dumpster fire. Today she was simply lost for words. So what, what do you make of what we're seeing? Uh, well, it's really kind of a phenomenal thing to watch. Uh, like you said, it's been 100 years since we've last, last had this kind of turmoil at the opening of a Congress. Uh, normally this is a very boring day. It's very pro forma. All of, this, uh, all of the drama sort of put aside and a bunch of pomp and circumstances replaced by it. Um, we've seen anything but that the last three days. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see if Mr. McCarthy has been able to break through some of the uh, dissidents that he's had within his party. Um, I think this first vote's really critical for him on day three. If he has not shown that he can flip some of these people, uh, some of the holdouts uh, that continue to vote against him, uh, this may be the final ballot that we see Mr. McCarthy on there. And it could be that we move on to another candidate for Speaker of the House. Ah, that's interesting. So you think, uh, in effect, uh, this is the last go or almost the last go. Let's not be too definitive. But you think that time is, is simply running out. If it keeps happening, he keeps hitting the wall, he has to, in the end, throw the towel in. Well, in the last 24 hours, he basically conceded to all of the demands that conservatives wanted from him. Um, he gave them really prime committee, he guaranteed really prime committee spots. He guaranteed legislation. He said they would be better represented on more prestigious committees. Um, so it's really hard to see where he goes from here. Um, if he doesn't produce some results or some sort of movement within his opposition within the next ballot or two, his coalition may start to fracture. In fact, last night there were rumors that Mr. Scalise, the number two in the Republican Party, uh, may be proposed as an as a potential replacement candidate if Mr. McCarthy can't follow through. So, yes, it could go on further, um, but if he doesn't show much progress, you only have to wonder how long this coalition can keep uh, continuing to vote for a very futile candidate. So um, it'll be interesting to watch as they get through the end of the roll call here. Where do you think the Republican Party as a whole goes and, and the damage that is doing for them? Well, I think what you're seeing is sort of a lot of things coming to culmination. This is not the first time the conservatives and leadership have been in a quarrel. Uh, don't forget uh, Speaker Boehner, uh, a couple speakers ago, was pushed out by this same faction of conservatives. Uh, speaker Paul Ryan was basically pushed out by this same group. So what you're seeing is just more and more tension, more and more of the same, and it's really coming to a head. Uh, the conservatives want the leadership to be more responsive to them. Um, and the leadership has not done that significantly enough uh, to satisfy them. So. 
Uh, what you're seeing is really a decade of frustration among conservatives within the Republican Party. Um, so what we're seeing now is that tension boil over into the public sphere. Normally, this stuff has been handled behind the scenes, uh, but this year it's been a little bit too much for conservatives to handle. So they brought all of their power and their might, and they're withholding votes until they get what they want from the leaders. And of course, strangely enough, we've got uh, the anniversary, haven't we, of January the 6th coming up uh, tomorrow. Uh, all of that is feeds into some of the debates going on within the, the Republican Party and, of course, the influence of uh, Donald Trump, despite his backing of uh, Kevin McCarthy in the last couple of days. I mean, there's been talk and speculation of, of somehow the Democrats uh, uh, rallying around to get a more moderate candidate. C can you see any scenario where where that actually happens? I can see Democrats wanting that to happen very badly, but the chances of that actually occurring are slim and none. Um, Republicans, despite the fact that they um, may not agree on who their leader should be, they certainly agree that um, probably Democrats should not be picking the Speaker of the House, given they have a majority. Um, so it's very, very unlikely that they'll be working with centrist Democrats to elect a more moderate uh, leader of the House representatives. This will almost certainly be a Republican affair um, in terms of who they decide to, to lead them. Joshua Hudder, we, uh, we'll leave it there. Uh, perhaps we'll talk again tomorrow. Who knows with uh, what is going on? But thank you so much for that analysis. Thanks for being with us. Very well. Thank you. Now let's turn to the war in Ukraine because the Russian President Vladimir Putin has ordered a 36-hour ceasefire across the front lines in Ukraine when the Orthodox Christmas uh, marks Christmas Day. Vladimir Putin's statement asked the Ukrainian side to reciprocate, but Kyiv has already rejected the idea. Let's get more details from James Waterhouse. He's there for us in Kyiv. Uh, so 36 hours is being suggested by the Russians, but uh, almost instantly slapped down by the Ukrainians. So, so tell us a little more. Well, Matthew, Kyiv isn't buying this proposal. If we start with the statement itself, it is significant. It is the first time since the 24th of February that Vladimir Putin has suggested a complete pausing of hostilities. He has called on Ukraine to do the same, as you say, to enable Orthodox Christians to celebrate Christmas this coming weekend. The ceasefire was, uh, is proposed to start at midday tomorrow and to finish at midnight on Saturday. But Mikhailo Podolyak, for example, a senior presidential advisor, has described this statement as an instrument of propaganda. He has accused Vladimir Putin of once again trying to portray himself, trying to portray a human side to appeal to uh, his critics back home. So you, we are not going to see, I don't think, thousands of Ukrainian soldiers along a front line spanning 700 miles. We're not going to see them suddenly downing uh, weapons. I think that's safe to say. So as ever, uh, come the question marks. Why has Vladimir Putin announced this? Well, he had a phone call with President Erdogan of Turkey earlier today, a man who has pretty successfully played the broker role in this conflict between Ukraine and Russia, where he said meaningful talks should be coupled with a ceasefire. So has Vladimir Putin listened? Or, as Ukraine uh, suggests, is he trying to buy time to mobilise more men for his faltering campaign? It's, as ever, not clear, and we won't have to wait long to see whether the, any kind of action will match the words of today from the Kremlin. Just a brief final thought, because uh, as you're talking, I see the UN chief has welcomed any truce in Ukraine. But in terms of the, the Ukrainian side, uh, in terms of what you've been saying, should we expect then attacks to continue from Ukrainian forces? Well, let's look at it in the practical sense. Take the eastern city of Bakhmut uh, in the Donetsk region. This is a place where we are seeing the heaviest fighting at the moment. Russian soldiers and defending Ukrainian soldiers are fighting in incredibly close proximity. So how does this play out? Are they suddenly going to back out to their trench positions? Uh, is it indeed, as Ukraine has previously suggested, a trap on part of the Russians? It could potentially, as we look at the language from Kiev today, be seen as an opportunity in a, in a military sense. But of course, there are the global players around the war in Ukraine. Germany has reacted. We've just heard from the UN where they say ceasefires are the way to go, are the path out of this war. But Ukraine, on both fronts, is having none of it. James, thanks very much. Thank you.
Now, if you thought there wasn't much more that Prince Harry could say about life in the royal family after his six-hour-long Netflix series, think again, because his new book, uh, due out next week, has been leaked, but the BBC hasn't seen it. There are a series of sensational claims and accusations and deeply personal stories about his family, including in conversation uh, that were actually had. There's an alleged physical altercation with his brother, Prince William, over Meghan back in 2019 and claims of drug taking. Here's our royal correspondent, Nicholas Witchell. I don't know how staying silent is ever going to make things better. So says Harry in the latest trailer for the interview he's given to ITV, setting out his grievances against his family. Grievances which are to be set out in startling detail in his book Spare, to be published worldwide next Tuesday. The Guardian's New York correspondent has obtained a leaked copy of the book, and in it, he says, Harry gives details of a physical attack on him by his elder brother. It evidently happened in 2019 at Harry's home inside Kensington Palace. According to this account, the brothers had an angry confrontation. William called Meghan difficult, rude and abrasive. Harry said William was parroting the press narrative. Then, according to the Guardian account, the confrontation escalated until William grabbed me by the collar, ripping my necklace and knocked me to the floor. I landed on the dog's bowl, which cracked under my back, the pieces cutting into me. I lay there for a moment, dazed, then got to my feet and told him to get out. William left, then returned, looking regretful and apologised. Harry, it appears, has no regrets about sharing private family moments. He's challenged by Tom Bradby in the ITV interview. Wouldn't your brother say to you, Harry, how could you do this to me? After everything, after everything we went through, wouldn't that be what he would say? He'd probably say all sorts of different things. Some people will say, you have railed against invasions of your privacy all your life. But they, the accusation will be, here are you invading the privacy of your most nearest and dearest without permission. That'll be the accusation. That'll be the accusation from the people that don't understand or don't want to believe that my family have been briefing the press. So, amid all these attacks on his family, what does Harry see as his future? If you're invited to the coronation, will you come? There's a lot that can happen between now and then. But, you know, the door is always open. The, the ball is in their court. There's a lot to be discussed, and I really hope that they are willing to sit down and talk about it. For now, neither Buckingham Palace nor Kensington Palace are making any comment. Well, that was Nicholas Witchell. Uh, Martin Pengeli is the breaking news editor for the Guardian newspaper US. He was the journalist that got the leak, and he has read the whole book, and he spoke to me a little earlier. The claims of the physical attack um, stand out from a succession of scenes uh, about uh, confrontations within the royal family between Harry and William and, and other members, which have been discussed elsewhere in the documentary, uh, in trailers of interviews and so forth. Um, but the fight, I've, I've done it again, I've said fight, it's not a fight, it's not described as a fight, it's described as an attack because Harry says he didn't fight back. Um, that was a detail uh, we hadn't obviously seen before, which is why we came with it. And it seems to have been a particularly low point in a particularly difficult period between the two brothers. Yes, we know the relationship has fractured. Uh, tell me some of the other observations you make, because you've gone through the book. I can see a number of lines that are, are breaking on my uh, television screen here in, in front of me uh, around Harry, seeing somebody with powers. Just tell me more of the other things apart from the attack in the book. Yeah, well, we, we published a second short story about what he says about visiting a woman who he doesn't name, doesn't locate, and doesn't use the word psychic or medium, but says had powers and said had a message for him from uh, his mother, um, Princess Diana. That was obviously, that um, is a remarkable uh, passage. It's a remarkably written book. It, it, it propels you. It switches styles a few times because his life does. It, there's a large section in the middle about Afghanistan, which I think uh, other papers are now reporting. His view of the press and his relations with the press are obviously <laughs> horrifically uh, complicated. He's, he's very, as we know, and it's repeated in the book, very, very, very angry about the paparazzi, the tabloids, the, the, the chase of Diana, the chase of him. Um, he's very uh, talks in detail about how various uh, factions in the royal family play the press, but of course he's playing the press too. Now, 
So it's part of, it's all part of that endless, I guess. I don't know what you call it, game or or even soap opera that that goes on with the the, the royals and part of the book is about Prince Harry's attempt to escape it. But then again, when, the way he's telling the book, the way he's releasing it, he's not escaping it. And of course, he very much uh, would uh, dispute that word you just use, that it is a game. He talks endlessly uh, about the real world impact it has. I'm sure you won't tell me how you got this leak, but it's ironic, isn't it? Because the couple uh, complain constantly about the leaks about them, but somehow uh, you have got a leak of this book. Yes, somehow, uh, not divulging sources. I, I, w I will say I've noticed, until I stopped looking at my Twitter notifications today because they've become an absolute mess, um, there was some theory going around last night that I'm friends with Harry and Meghan somehow, which I'm really not. Um, it's, that's not, I, I would say that is it. It's not coming, it's not, a, it's not an orchestrated leak. Can I ask you how long you've had it in your possession when, when you actually got the leak itself? Uh, yesterday. I'm a speed reader. <laughs> and <laughs> so just, just a final thought then, because uh, talking to somebody who's actually seen the whole of the book, read every page, what is the thing that, that, that surprised you, maybe shocked you the, the most f from all of the contents? Well, without revealing the contents, even though the book is now spilling out, um, we're not, we are, you know, we have a way we, we go about stories like this with not to reveal too much. It goes to some very, very personal places and spaces, like physical spaces that he describes in events and conversations. It's really very, um, uh, right word, uh, naked, maybe psychologically naked. He, and it, it was striking to me. I'm not a seasoned royal watcher. I'm a US politics reporter most of the time. Um, so I'm not sort of as finely tuned as I might be to, 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 the, to what was new or what was not, but you can, immediately sense this is a very, very personal telling. Even if written with a ghostwriter, it comes across as very, very raw. A, a quick postscript then in, in, in terms of what you've just said. Damaging for the royal family here? Well, you'd think so. Um, it's, uh, you know, that the story we published last night, it's not good. It doesn't make William look good. It does, it does say he apologised. It does say he said it wasn't an attack, but it doesn't make him look good. It's, it's not good. It's a a horrible, horribly difficult scene between two brothers. Well, fascinating interview. That was Martin Pengeli, the Guardian journalist who broke that story, has seen the leak, has read the whole of that book. Uh, I want to take you back to Washington, uh, breaking developments on our top story, because these, the scenes there, because uh, Kevin McCarthy uh, has failed to win enough votes in that seventh round of voting to become the U.S. House Speaker. We had uh, indications that he was going to lose, but that vote has concluded, and it's concluded in failure again in this, the third day of voting. It is expected to go to an eighth round. We were just talking to an analyst a while ago who was saying at some stage he thought Kevin McCarthy would have to, to make way um, for another Republican to perhaps uh, secure the votes to, to make him or her the Speaker. But uh, that, the breaking news, uh, Kevin McCarthy has failed to win enough votes to win in that seventh round of voting. More on that here on the programme in a moment or two. I have, over my 30 years, seen many patients who have excessive sweating. I recommend Carpe. It's a game changer. Carpe is up to three times stronger than a regular strength antiperspirant. Try it today at MyCarpe.com with limited time free shipping. 92% of households that kick off the year with Peloton are still active a year later? Yeah, actively using it as a coat rack. Congrats on 50 rides! Okay, but it's still just a fad. Just an elitist fitness cult. Come on, guys. I know this isn't easy, but we got this. You'll give up eventually. Seriously? 92%. 92% stick with it. So can you. Get $500 off Peloton packages. Terms apply. Roy and Debbie retired, then had to face a volatile market. They contacted their personal capital advisor and checked our free retirement planner. Now they feel confident and no longer worry about what the market may bring. Start today at personalcapital.com.
Welcome back to today's Global here on BBC World News. Uh, well, President Biden uh, says he intends to visit the US-Mexico border on Sunday, which will be the first time he's done that since he took office. In the last hour or so, the president addressed the border issues, describing the current immigration system as, quote, broken. The White House announced a new safe and humane plan which will see the U.S. take 30,000 immigrants a month directly from Cuba, Haiti and Nicaragua, whilst also tightening restrictions on migrants crossing the southern border. Well, speaking from the White House, President Biden said it's been hard to understand what is actually happening at the border due to such divisive politics. Well, let me explain what I'm going to do and as clearly and plainly as I can. I know it's a complicated issue. I don't want to pretend there's anything easy about it. People come to America for a whole lot of different reasons, to seek new opportunity in what is the strongest economy in the world. Can't blame them wanting to do it. They flee oppression, you know, uh, to, the, to the freest nation in the world. They chase their own American dream in the greatest nation in the world. And the story of America is the story of so many of your families, including mine, going back to the mid-1800s from Ireland. Well, that was President Biden. Let's head to Capitol Hill, get the latest from our North America correspondent, Will Grant. And Will, uh, as a correspondent, you have covered this story so many times on the ground. Uh, your assessment of what we've heard, this new plan from the president. Well, in a sense, Matthew, this is an attempt to normalise the entrance for at least a fraction of those people coming from those nations you mentioned, Cuba, um, Haiti and Nicaragua, nations who are all going through extremely difficult moments in their own way. However, it only really opens a legal pathway for 30,000 of them a, a month. So we're going to hear, I think, criticisms from two camps. The first and obvious camp is the Republican Party, who are simply going to uh, accuse the Biden administration of failing to sufficiently answer this issue with a robust answer to sufficiently clamp down on border security issues. I think the other question, though, will come from um, advocacy groups for migrant rights. They're going to say that this has basically started to close uh, pathways to entry for people genuinely fleeing violence, genuinely searching asylum in the US. So, I mean, one of the elements that the Biden administration, I think, are quite proud of and they've described as generous is the fact that um, people will be able to apply from those nations via their mobile phones. And he warned them to simply not come without having done that first, without having a financial sponsor in this country, because they will be deported to Mexico. Grant to there on Capitol Hill. Thanks very much for the latest. Thank you. Now let's turn to Rome, where the former Pope Benedict XVI has been laid to rest today. Tens of thousands of mourners attended a requiem mass for him in a misty St. Peter's Square including representatives from royal families and members of the Roman Catholic clergy. Pope Francis, of course, led today's service, praising his predecessor for bestowing wisdom, tenderness and devotion on the Catholic faithful. Here's our religion editor, Ali Makbul, with this report from the Vatican. Before the largest church in all Christendom, in front of a crowd of 50,000, he was brought for one final time to spontaneous applause. It was the last occasion the two popes were together, one presiding over the funeral of the other. During his homily, Pope Francis used biblical references in which he appeared to compare Benedict to Jesus. We want to do this with the same wisdom, tenderness and devotion that he bestowed on us over the years. Together we want to say, Father, into your hands we commend his spirit. In the crowd were an estimated 4,000 members of the clergy and many who admired the Pope Emeritus as a theologian and intellectual. Although, of course, Pope Benedict wasn't a sitting pope when he died, a lot of the liturgy, a lot of the rituals are those that we've seen through the ages at papal funerals. Unusually, though, at this funeral, for the first time in centuries, prayers are 
devoted to both petitions to God for both the previous Pope and the current one. And there was a final farewell prayer. Inside the coffin with Pope Benedict, a deed detailing his achievements. It included a line about his role in tackling abuse that's riled some of his critics. There are others, though, who called out as the service ended that Benedict XVI should now be made a saint. Aline McBool, BBC News, at the Vatican. Well, that is almost it. Uh, let's end this edition where we started. Let me take you back to the House of Representatives, where, of course, uh, in the last few minutes, we've seen Kevin McCarthy fail to win enough votes to become Speaker for the seventh vote. Uh, apparently, it is expected to go to the eighth round. Just when will Kevin McCarthy give up, or does he keep going? Extraordinary scenes there on Capitol Hill. Thanks for watching. Thank you.